Okay, hey, it's Mark again, and tonight's segment is going to be on um, the inerrancy of Scripture, uh, God, continuing in the series on God's Word. And this is a very crucial aspect of God's Word. And ever since the Garden, there has been an assault on God's Word. You remember the very first words of Satan in the guise of the serpent was, Did God say? And then he misquoted the Lord to Eve. And um, people today still have an antipathy or hatred of God's word because of the God behind the word. And... Uh, God's Word tells us very clearly that unbelievers are enemies of God, and uh, He is their enemy, which is the whole idea of reconciliation, is to overcome that uh, animosity. But there is a deep, inbred hatred of God's Word, and... Um, one of the ways that that has manifested itself is an attack on the authority of God's Word. And this goes back for several centuries. But just um, bringing it into my own uh, lifetime, um, I, uh, I came to know the Lord when I was uh, 18 years old and it was not out of some kind of intellectual persuasion or after some long pursuit of truth. It was totally an emotional um, leap of faith because I was an emotional wreck and at the end of my rope, and um, long story short, some guys uh, cared enough about me to spend some time with me. And they knew that uh, even though I had a reputation as being one of, if not the biggest hellraiser at our high school, um, they saw beneath the surface that uh, not all guys like that are uh, necessarily um, big, bad, and, and uh, happy. I had people who were afraid of me uh, because of, but there was a reason for that. Um, two years earlier, my brother had died, and uh, I became a very angry young man, and I consciously hated God as a result of that, and uh, Tried to fill that vo um, terrible void in my heart with uh, excessive partying and fighting and all kinds of crazy behavior. And um, so, but that came to an end, uh, the party did, and the only place I had was the Lord. And through the ministry of Young Life, I... Uh, my life was, was spared and saved. But the, the, <clears throat> a few months later, I um, went to NC State, and um, I immediately began to experience what Anselm called Fides Quarns Intellectum, that's faith-seeking understanding. And my brain wanted to catch up with my heart, and I was very much committed to the Lord. Um, he saved my life, literally. But my, uh, my brain wanted to know why I believed what I believed. <clears throat> and so I uh, immediately jumped into basically a double major of philosophy <clears throat> and religion. And uh, those of you who know anything about the history of philosophy, in one sense, excuse me, <clears throat> it's... Uh, is the criticism uh, one after another of the Christian faith uh, looked at from one perspective 
and then I also, to my uh, sorrow, found out that the New Testament classes and the Old Testament classes weren't exactly friendly to uh, my endeavor to try to understand um, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, in fact, I, what I saw at, uh, in the Old Testament classes and the New Testament class, in fact, we had to go down to Meredith College, which is an all girls college next door to take the Old Testament class, which was pretty cool. But anyway, um, our professor, it just seemed like one class after another, especially in the religion classes, which puzzled me as a young believer, seemed like that the, uh, the professors went out of their way and took delight in trying to point out the various alleged contradictions and errors in the Bible. And it became apparent to me very quickly the vicious spiritual wounds that were being inflicted in um, those classrooms. Because for the first time, we were away from home searching for ourselves, what to believe, many of us. And um, I was trying to get a intellectual foundation for what I believed. Thankfully, I had been turned on to guys like Francis Schaeffer um, early on, so I had a, a safety net to, to help me. But a lot of other people didn't, and I saw a lot of people just bite the dust uh, as a result of taking New Testament classes and Old Testament classes. It was tragic. You know, being told that um, Moses didn't write the, the Pentateuch, but that there were three different levels of it and the documentary hypothesis. That's devastating to the authority of Scripture. Because there's one thing I want to make real clear, is that the doctrine of inerrancy is not a um, theoretical notion, because it's inextricably tied together with the authority of scripture and the truthfulness of scripture. Inerrancy just simply means that the Bible doesn't make mistakes, it doesn't err. Um, the infallibility of scripture is a stronger notion. It says it's incapable of erring or making mistakes. The inerrancy just says that it does not um, have errors in it. But I was being told every day in class that it did have errors in it, left and right. And it was filled with contradictions and filled with errors. And um, that was, in the long run, it helped to strengthen my faith. But boy, I tell you, it was some kind of a um, challenge. <laughs> and as I said, it bothered me because I... I saw, I looked at Psalm 119 and just the utter um, awe in which that psalmist had of God's word, God's law, and I compared that with the, uh, the attitude of the professors and the seeming delight instead of in God's law, but in vandalizing God's law. And I thought to myself, how in the world can someone be regenerate and take delight in tearing apart and vandalizing God's word? And I've never gotten over that. still wonder that, how somebody can be regenerate and take delight in uh, tearing apart God's word. So, um, Understanding the inerrancy of Scripture is a vital, vital aspect to the whole idea of God's Word because, as I said, it's inextricably connected with the authority of His Word. And if, um, if the Bible 
is not true in areas like history and science and archaeology. That is, if it's not true in areas where it is, it's empirically verifiable, the Bible has mistakes in it in, in areas of pertaining to history and science and archaeology, then how can we trust it when it comes to areas where it's non-verifiable? That is, the so-called spiritual, uh, regarding spiritual matters. And um, that's an incredibly crucial issue or question. And so I remember reading a book by Francis Schaeffer that helped me tremendously. It was Gen Genesis and Space and Time. It's one of his shorter books, Genesis and Space and Time. And uh, uh, I can't tell you how much that helped to put those things um, in order. And he, he talked about that very issue that you know, if we doubt the authority and accuracy of Scripture when it comes to matters that can be verified, um, then that undermines our ability to trust it when it comes to, quote, spiritual matters. But the Bible is, um, the Christian faith, I should say, is unique in that our faith is couched in, in um, space and time. It's the drama of redemption that's played out in space and time in history. And um, so if the historical component, the archaeological component, say for example Luke's gospel, um, is not accurate, then why should we believe the words of uh, when it comes to salvation or other spiritual issues? But we since have found out that Luke is uh, the most accurate of ancient historians compared to anyone else far above Josephus, Josephus uh, and some of these other guys. And um, so I just want to impress upon you that the inerrancy of Scripture is something that is a crucial doctrine in our, for our day. Um, back in the 70s when I was in high school, there was what was known as a battle for the Bible. In fact, Harold Lenzel wrote a book called The Battle for the Bible. And um, that's when it, the, the battle is truly raging at its high, highest, but it's, it's raging today. Because I think if you were to ask most pastors, we're talking about uh, in mainline churches, the Methodists and the Presbyterian, I'm Presbyterian, in a small Presbyterian denomination, a Bible-believing one. Um, but probably most pastors today would not, um, if you ask them, would tell you that they do not affirm the inerrancy of Scripture. And I've never wondered... Uh, or never understood how they could be a pastor if they didn't under or grasp or believe in 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 the, in the inerrancy of scripture because it undermines the whole authority of of the message that they're giving Sunday after Sunday. Um, but it's in academic circles the idea of the inerrancy of scripture um, is. That word, inerrancy, for most academicians, uh, connote, it's a very emotive word, and for most academicians, it's, it just means that whoever believes it is some dumb, stupid, backwoods fundamentalist. And uh, it, was, <laughs> it was in this context that... Um, some not-so-dumb theologians from around the world, R.C. Sproul, um, let's see, guys like J.I. Packer and Roger Nicole, other fellows got together, and long story short, they uh, came up with um, 
the ICBI or International Council on Biblical Inerrancy. And um, so one thing I would recommend to you, if you haven't already, if you're interested in this topic, um, is to get online, just Google uh, ICBI, International Council on Biblical Inerrancy, the Chicago Statement. And what it is, is just a short statement on the importance of biblical inerrancy. And then it has, I think, 19 affirmations and denials as to what inerrancy means and does not mean. And uh, the denials are just as important because it helps to clarify what we don't mean by inerrancy because there's a lot of misconceptions about it. And... Um, characterizations about it and uh, but I just wanted to go on the record on saying that inerrancy is a non-negotiable issue when it comes to the Bible it's one of those few issues worth going to the mat so so to speak uh, and debating over uh, but it's you know like I said, it was the very first thing that the devil challenged in the garden, and he continues to today. Because you undermine the authority of God's word, then um, you under undermine God, because that people know that that's the His revelation to us, and if you cast doubt on the authority and the accuracy of his word, then you've gone a long way to keeping people away from, from heaven and eternal life from God. So this book, this this holy Bible, has been the target of the evil one for a long time. And our sinful nature, uh, don't like to use that term, our uh, indwelling sin. Like we only have one nature. Uh, it uh, the remaining flesh doesn't still fights against the authority of God, you know. And um, but for unbelievers, they really have a, a problem with that. So please check out the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy because that will lay out in detail what I don't have time to tonight. So how do we defend the notion of the inerrancy of Scripture? Well, basically, historically, there's, there's been two, two ways. Presuppos presuppositional um, approach and the evidential approach presuppositional and uh, evidential and there's other ways but those two basic ones and um, the presupposition one would, would include confessional you know appealing to your denominations confessions regarding the nature of scripture but uh, I personally think it's, it's best to uh, combine the two um, and I think it, it, a lot of people have a misunderstanding about folks like Van Til and John Frame who are presuppositionalists. Um, they they used evidences uh, for sure, but that's, that's a distinct issue. But when it comes to presupposition, what I mean is by what the Bible has to say about itself. You know, we assume, we know that the Bible is the Word of God, so what does the Bible say about itself? And so if we look at passages like uh, Matthew 5, um, Jesus, what was Jesus' view of the Bible? He said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And listen to this. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. 
Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now, Jesus had um, an iota or a dot, dot um, view of, of inspiration. His view of inspiration went down to the very smallest little dot in the Hebrew Bible. I'd say that's pretty specific and pretty comprehensive. And John 17, 17 says that uh, your word is truth. And note that it's not an adjective. It doesn't say your word is true. Of course, it is that. But in this context, it says your word is truth as a noun, uh, which is really stronger in the sense that um, the Bible as God's word is the criterion uh, of all truth. And it, no other criterions of truth can be brought against it. It is, it is the truth. And um, all other claims for truth should and must be uh, compared or contrasted with, uh, with Scripture. Um, and it's the source of all our knowledge, uh, ultimately. And the text that we looked at last time, 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is inspired by God, or God breathed, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And uh, Theonustus, uh, the doctrine of inspiration is closely connected with uh, inerrancy. Um, if you have the God of truth, inspiring his word, then it's a pretty ridiculous notion to think that the God of truth is going to inspire error. And it says that all of scripture is inspired, not part of it, all of scripture. That would mean Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. So for someone to, if you ask a Christian, um, you know, is God's word inspired? You know, someone who doesn't believe in inspiration. I'm just giving you a little hint on maybe a way to communicate, uh, and maybe persuade somebody who doesn't believe in uh, the inerrancy of Scripture. Ask them if they believe that all Scripture is inspired by God, and they they have to say yes if they believe this passage. And then ask them if uh, they believe that God inspires error. And hopefully they'll say no. And then from that say, well, guess what? Uh, is the Bible in there? God inspires all his word. He doesn't inspire error. Therefore, it's in error. That error. Anyway, <laughs> so that's a presuppositional way, just very quickly, as a few verses to look at, and there's a ton more of where Jesus talks about um, his own view of Scripture uh, in the Gospels. And, um, you know, we see we see again the combination of uh, the inerrancy and the authority of scripture and his temptations in the wilderness with Satan. Uh, the three uh, culminating temptations. He was tempted the whole time, but the three main ones came at the end. You know what his response was? Satan tempted him tempted him, him and all three times the Son of God 
God in human flesh said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And so in the midst of spiritual warfare, he appealed to the inerrant, authoritative word of God. Those two are like uh, two sides of the, uh, of the coin. In order to have an authoritative word, you have to have it. It has to be an errant, and uh, an authoritative word is going to be an errant, and vice versa. So, um, but for Jesus Himself, you know, He appealed to to God's authoritative word. So He had the presuppositional approach and then the evidential approach, which y'all are more probably more familiar with and. When I was in college, I was helped a great deal uh, by Josh McDowell's books. Uh, you know, I mentioned to you that, that in Old Testament, we, you know, we were learning the documentary hypothesis, you know, how there were supposedly several authors of the Pentateuch. Um, and if you want to know who I believe wrote the Pentateuch, it was Moses. <laughs> Um, how do you explain his death? Well, it was common practice to quote, hook in. Uh, Joshua, the next writer, writer, hooked in. And uh, to the last book in the Pentateuch and uh, Deuteronomy and um, mentioned and spoke of, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Moses' death and hooked in in a couple other places as well. But it was Moses who wrote the Pentateuch. Uh, it, things like uh, evidence that demands a verdict, more evidence that demands a verdict, that helped me tremendously to see the inerrancy of Scripture and the uh, evidence for it. And you recall, at this time for me, I was a few days, quarters, and electing. My brain was... My, my 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 mind was just um, on a um, I was a man on a mission, and nothing else counted to me. Uh, seriously, I was single focused in finding evidence for the truth of, and I knew instinctively that uh, the authority of God's word and the, the notion of inerrancy was the crucial issue because all the other stuff that I was concerned about wanting to, to know and, and and have affirmed in my mind it, it, it all started and was based on the foundation of God's word because that's where we get all our information from so I knew instinctively as a young dude young buck that uh, the main issue was the authority of God's word, or uh, stated another way, the inerrancy, inerrancy of God's word. You take away the inerrancy, and you have no authority. So, um, I remember another book that helped me a great deal uh, was uh, the New Testament documents, Are They Reliable? by F.F. F. Bruce. There were books on uh, archaeology, uh, which showed that there were not only no archaeological finds that um, contradicted scripture, but every archaeological find, find thus far supported it. Uh, you have things, books like um, Fulfilled Prophecy, that shows the um, authority of scripture, and... Um, you know, that list can go on and on. And since then, the 70s, since the middle of the 70s when I was in college, the, you know, there's been a ton of books that have come out that support the authority of Scripture. Uh, Lee Strobel's series, um, very helpful. And um, I've left out intentionally a, a, a bunch of other books just for the sake of time. But... You know, when it it's a matter of compassion. I learned this from from uh, Schaefer. You know, if someone has an honest intellectual question, 
it's a, it's a matter of compassion to give them to the best of your ability an honest intellectual answer, a satisfying one. And if you don't know it, then to, to take the time to research it and um, so the next time you'll know how to answer or tell a person I don't know and I'll get back with you. But please, you know, sure, some questions are dodges and a lot of, a lot of the questions that people have are um, not basically intellectual but are um, moral, spiritual um, rebellion. But nevertheless, I know from my own experience um, that a lot of questions that many people have, um, at least on one some level, there's a sincerity. And um, I've, I've learned that there can be levels of motives. And um, so we ought to give the people the benefit of the doubt. Only God knows people's hearts so that if they ask questions about the authority of Scripture and particularly about its inerrancy, inerrancy, then we need to affirm with real boldness that the Bible is inerrant and infallible. Uh, again, infallible means that it is incapable of making mistakes. Inerrant simply means it does not make mistakes or it does not have errors in it. Now, of course, this applies primarily to the autographs or the original documents, but because of how um, sophisticated um, the manuscript evidence and that science has become, it's, uh, I don't know if you can see this or not. See, I don't know if you can see that or not. The bottom the textual apparatus. You see the textual apparatus at the bottom here? Okay, that, that takes up actually two thirds of the page. When I read my Greek text, which is as often as I can, um, there, this that has become such a um, fine art and science that the English Bible we have today, you can have the assurance of knowing that it's 99.99999% um, equivalent to the original. And so you are, you are you are reading you are reading the original for all intents and purposes. It is the Word of God. And God in his providence has superintended the um, uh, transmission of those manuscripts as well as the um, uh, various translations. And, um, you know, I, I will end with saying that there's a reason why the Bible is called the Holy Bible. And that in the first instance is holy because the author is holy and we looked at that earlier um, and it's second secondly it's holy because it is the word of God God is holy and then lastly it's the holy bible because it teaches us how to be holy um, but in order to have the kind of faith that is courageous and particularly in the midst of life storms, we have to have the confidence in its authority. And let me just assure you that the Bible is truly inerrant and infallible because our God is infallible. He is incapable of making a mistake and remember what we said this is God's word so it's going to manifest his attributes let's pray Father thank you 
that in your kindness and love you've given us your holy Bible. Without it, we would know nothing. But with it, we know all the wonderful things about you and about the world that you have created, about the Savior that you have sent for us, and the unspeakable redemption that we have in the Lord Jesus. Thank you that your word is truth, that it is both infallible and inerrant, and thus authoritative. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.